7,000 years ago, a man died alone in a cave in what is now northern Spain. No metal, no farming, no cities. Just stone tools, smoke-stained walls, and a body left behind by a world that never wrote its own history. When scientists pulled DNA from his bones, they expected a familiar story. What they found instead forced them to erase one. His skin was dark. His hair was black. But his eyes were unmistakably blue. Not the blue of modern Europe. Not the blue you associate with light skin or northern climates. This was something older. Stranger. Because blue eyes did not arrive with civilization. They did not arrive with farmers. They did not arrive with Europe at all. They were already here. Before we go any further, one thing has to be cleared up. Blue eyes are not blue. There is no blue pigment in the human eye. None. Eye color is decided by melanin, the same substance that colors skin and hair. The more melanin packed into the iris, the darker the eye appears. Brown eyes are rich in it. Blue eyes are not. When light enters an eye with very little melanin, it scatters instead of being absorbed. Short wavelengths bounce back. Blue is what your brain sees. It's the same reason the sky looks blue. An optical effect, not a color. This happens because of a small genetic switch that controls how much melanin the iris produces. Not a new pigment, not a redesign of the eye, just a dimmer turn down. Many genes influence eye color, but in most people of European ancestry, one regulatory change dominates the outcome. Flip that switch low enough, and the eye stops absorbing light blue appears. If you're interested in how ancient DNA keeps overturning things we were taught growing up, this is exactly what Stone and Bone is about. Subscribe now, because this story only gets more unsettling from here. For a long time, scientists believed light eyes arrived alongside light skin. The logic felt clean. As farming spread into Europe, skin lightened to cope with weaker sunlight, and eye color followed. Then, ancient DNA ruined that simplicity. In a cave in northern Spain, researchers recovered the remains of a Mesolithic hunter-gatherer. No agriculture. No domesticated animals. No Neolithic lifestyle of any kind. His genome told a different story than his bones suggested. Genetic markers linked to darker skin were still present. Hair color pointed to black or very dark brown. But the same regulatory switch associated with blue eyes was already there. That single result collapsed an assumption that had gone unchallenged for decades. Blue eyes did not arrive as part of a package deal with farming. They did not wait for lighter skin. They existed independently, in people who would not fit modern ideas of European appearance at all. Before we go any further, pause for a moment. Did you assume blue eyes and light skin evolved together? If that was your assumption, leave a comment. Most people make it without realizing why. At this point, it would have been easy to dismiss the discovery in Spain as an exception. One skeleton. One unusual genome. Science has survived stranger outliers. Then came evidence that had no right to exist at all. In Denmark, archaeologists uncovered a lump of ancient birch pitch. It was hardened tree resin, once chewed to soften it, then discarded. Stone Age chewing gum. It wasn't found in a grave. It wasn't protected by ritual. It wasn't meant to last. Yet inside it was saliva. Inside the saliva was DNA, not fragments. A complete genome. When researchers reconstructed the individual behind it, the same contradiction appeared again. Dark hair, dark skin, and blue eyes. This mattered more than another skeleton ever could. Because bones are rare. Burials are selective. They tell us about death. Chewing gum tells us about life. This was not an elite burial or a ritual figure. It was an ordinary person, doing something mundane, leaving behind a genetic record by accident. And that accident showed the same pattern already seen in Mesolithic remains across Europe. By then, the implication was unavoidable. Blue eyes were not an anomaly. They were already circulating quietly among hunter-gatherer populations long before farming, long before cities, long before anyone tried to explain them. The old timeline wasn't just wrong, it was incomplete. This is where the story usually gets simplified. 
you'll often hear it phrased like this. Every person with blue eyes descends from one single human. It's clean. It's memorable. And it's misleading. What likely appeared once was a genetic variant, not a family line. A regulatory switch affecting how much melanin the iris produces. That switch spread through populations, not through a traceable genealogy. This is where people confuse ancestry with genetics. A trait does not need a single shared ancestor to become widespread. It needs the right population structure. In post-Ice Age Europe, humans lived in small, scattered groups, often 20 to 50 people at most, separated by forests, rivers, and changing climates. When groups like that split, merge, or disappear, chance outweighs design. If a rare variant exists in the survivors of a collapse, it becomes common without being chosen. Not because it's better, but because nothing else replaces it. Think of it like language. An accent can dominate a region without originating from one speaker. It spreads because the group carrying it becomes the reference point for everyone who comes after. Blue eyes followed the same logic. So no, blue-eyed people are not all cousins tracing back to one prehistoric individual. They share a genetic switch that persisted as populations fractured and reassembled. Most origin stories sound cleaner than reality. Genetic history almost never is. Does that make the story more interesting to you? Or does it strip away something you liked about it? Leave a comment. People tend to divide sharply on this. At the moment the variant first appeared, blue eyes would have been unusual, possibly striking, but still rare. What changed wasn't preference, it was scale. In modern populations of millions, rare traits stay rare. In ancient populations of dozens, rarity is unstable. Imagine a group of 30 people surviving a harsh climatic shift. Only 12 make it through. Two carry the blue eye variant. In the next generation, that variant is no longer uncommon. It's normal. In populations that small, a recessive trait can dominate in 10 to 15 generations. That's only a few centuries. No selection pressure is required. No advantage is necessary. And this process didn't happen once. After the Ice Age, Europe went through repeated demographic resets. Cold events. Resource collapses. Local extinctions. Entire groups vanished without descendants. Others expanded into the empty spaces they left behind. Blue eyes didn't spread because they were attractive, adaptive, or favored. They spread because the people carrying them were present when the population narrowed. Evolution didn't choose the trait. History filtered the people. That distinction matters. Because it means blue eyes are not a signal of success. They are a record of survival through loss. And that pattern repeats again and again in human history, whether we notice it or not. At this point, some explanations are tempting. Lower sunlight. Northern latitudes. Vitamin D. That logic works for skin color. It does not work for eye color. Skin pigmentation directly affects how efficiently the body produces vitamin D. Eye color does not. Blue eyes don't help you absorb more sunlight. They don't improve survival in darker climates. They don't solve a biological problem. What happened instead is quieter. As skin lightening genes rose under strong selection in northern regions, blue eyes came along for the ride in some populations. They weren't driving adaptation. They were hitchhiking on it. Not every trait that becomes common exists because it was useful. Some survive simply because they were present when the future narrowed. Today, blue eyes form a clear cluster in northern and eastern Europe, especially around the Baltic Sea. This often gets explained as origin. It shouldn't be. The mutation didn't start there. It stayed there. Southern Europe was repeatedly reshaped by incoming populations early farmers from the Near East, later movements during the Bronze Age, ongoing Mediterranean and North African contact. Each wave brought new ancestry and with it, new dominant eye color variants. The North experienced fewer of those resets. Populations remained smaller, more isolated, less rewritten. So blue eyes didn't rise faster in the Baltics. They were diluted elsewhere. What we're really seeing 
isn't a genetic hotspot. It's a region where history paused long enough for older patterns to remain visible. If you're from Europe, does this match what you see in your own family history, or does it contradict it? That contrast is often more revealing than any map. It's easy to think of blue eyes as a European trait. Modern maps make it look that way. But blue eyes existed before Europe did. They appeared before nations, before borders, before languages we recognize today. That's why blue and green eyes occasionally appear far from Northern Europe, in Central Asia, in parts of South Asia, in North Africa, not because those regions borrowed something European, but because human history is layered, not contained. Genes don't follow flags, they follow people. And the deeper you look into ancient DNA, the harder it becomes to draw clean lines between us and them. Those lines are recent, the genes are not. Blue eyes are often treated as something special, exotic, distinct. But they're not a victory of evolution. They're a record of survival through loss. They exist because certain populations endured while others disappeared without leaving descendants. Because small groups became future populations by accident. Because history closed paths behind them. When we call a trait ancient, we rarely think about how many ancient traits never made it this far. Every blue-eyed person today carries a genetic echo of people who left no names, no cities, and no stories. Only a switch in DNA that happened to persist. If you want more stories where ancient bones and forgotten DNA quietly rewrite what we think we know, subscribe to Stone and Bone. This is only one mutation. There are thousands more buried in the past, waiting to be uncovered.